Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We're with Graham Norbury today. I first saw you, Graham. Uh, I think it was about six months ago now on the Human Unleashed podcast or the first webinar that you did before you actually launched your website. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe August, September last year, maybe. Yeah. Um, fascinating insights. I've been all over the website and uh, watched more or less everything you put out on YouTube. Uh, it's very different to a lot of the, the, the personal development movement. It's very holistic in its approach. Could you give us a bit, little bit about your personal history and where, where you've come from? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm from Lancaster in uh, northwest England. Uh, grew up there. Was lucky enough to go to a pretty decent school. Um, we still had the sort of grammar school system there. And so I had an old-fashioned education. Um, I uh, then went briefly to university to study engineering, uh, which I dropped out of quite quickly. Just realised it just wasn't for me. That was in '85, something like that. Uh, and then I decided to go and live in London with my girlfriend. Took a job, uh, found a job very quickly. Uh, there was a boom in the stock market at that time, and they were looking for people who could count ten, basically. And so uh, I managed to get a job. Um, in the stock market, I knew nothing about it, and uh, I found it was something that I could do relatively easily. It, it, most people consider it to be quite stressful, but for me, it was lots of complicated inputs uh, and being able to sort of take the inputs, figure out what was going on, and respond. Um, something that uh, I find myself able to do. Mm -hmm. So I spent 30 years, approximately, in uh, in stockbroking, which I found fascinating initially. Um, I was able to live in London for a period of time. I lived in Scandinavia and ended up living in Spain for the last 18 years. But uh, during the last, uh, let's say around about the year, from the late 90s onwards, I began to get a little bit disillusioned with the entire thing. Um, I felt that having been in the business for that long, I should have been able to figure out more what was going on and what was likely to occur in, in markets. Yeah, I don't think I'm a stupid guy. And with the experience that I had, I, I really felt that I should be able to, to predict events uh, or at least outcomes with a little bit more accuracy. So I began to delve into reasons why uh, I was not capable of, of making a fortune investing. Um, and uh, I came across the sort of the underlying theory of, of um, sort of the monetary system. I looked into that in great detail. This was all in my private time. No one teaches you these things. And I came across the, the idea of sort of what is money fundamentally, what historically, what should it represent, uh, why does it not represent what it ought to. Um, and I came across, uh, I think like you did also, um, concept of precious metals as a store of wealth and value and a means of exchange mm -hmm. and that represents a tiny 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 fraction of the global financial system and in fact the majority of people that work in global finance have no understanding whatsoever of, of precious metals and monetary theory and once I discovered that I realized that that was the, the missing link that uh, meant that whatever you're looking at in terms of investment is priced in dollars or pounds or yen or euros and all those currencies are artificial constructs which are not fixed in quantity and it, it's clearly the system that we should be using but we're prevented from using it because of the pressure from the pharmaceutical industry so i i, I spent many years studying jack Cruz. um i've pretty much read everything he's produced and listened to everything he's ever 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 said well, I'm a, a fan yeah um, and i began to implement some of his ideas uh, into my own life and that of my family um and it, it just led to a, a much better understanding of health overall um and it, it it offered a much clearer way forward to me um and then i met phil escott um in fact, I met Phil Escott. He also became a member of Jack's site. Um, I didn't know him at all. He just popped up on Jack's forum, and he was he was a vegetarian, vegan hippie who had been crippled <laughs> with arthritis. Mm. Literally, I mean, that was his 
he, he wrote very well. He, he had a very entertaining writing style. He's very humorous. Uh, and he explained his problem. And he said, look, Jack, uh, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I can't do the science. Just tell me, this is my problem. What do I need to do? And so Jack laid it out for him fairly simply. Uh, and Phil, over the next year or two, reversed his rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, actually, psoriatic arthritis he had. But he was, he was crippled. He used to be a fit guy. Um, and he found himself crippled. He could barely walk. Whereas previously, he'd, he'd, he'd run a gym. He used to do mountain biking, play the drums, all these sorts of things. And he was given a diagnosis by his doctor that um, he was going to have arthritis for the rest of his life. Here, take these pills, go home. And Phil, to his credit, refused to accept that and found a way to reverse it. And he's now absolutely perfectly healthy. Um, Phil then went back to his doctor um, to try to say, look, I'm, I've managed to cure myself. Would you like to know what I've done? I've got a waiting room, a waiting room full of 10, <laughs> a dozen people out there who were all crippled like me. And so maybe I could share my, my, um, my learning with you. And the doctor sort of pretty much chased him out of his office and said, no, I haven't got time for all that nonsense. Wow. So Phil then began to try to share his knowledge uh, online and having sort of uh, little group meetings for free to just present to local people. So I went down to one of those, met Phil, um, and he he's done the work. He is uh, the, the embodiment of someone who has actually cured himself and reversed a chronic disease mm -hmm. so he's got a very compelling story but then some people asking questions as to why does it work how did you do it so that they start asking technical questions so i found myself helping him out with some of the technical answers yeah um and so we got we became very good friends uh he set up a group on facebook um to share his knowledge again it was a sort of free membership group which started with a handful of people he asked me to join the group sort of as the the sciencey guy if you like um and it's grown from a handful to i think there's thirteen thousand members now and there's some incredible stories on there of of, uh, of healing and reversal from from so many different chronic conditions um i mean the the, the simple stuff like weight loss and type 2 diabetes which is relatively simple to deal with yeah all through the the arthritis crohn's ibs um there's just huge numbers of people um so, so pra pragmatically speaking now <clears throat> you've mentioned jack cruz there correct me if i'm wrong here is a lot of that work focused on light um deuterium water magnetism um yes Okay, so, so pragmatically, because I'm not an academic, if you can sort of put steps in place, how can people use this knowledge to, to help themselves? Okay, well, what, what Jack's done is it, he's, he's written literally thousands of pages of deep science blogs. Mm. Um, so that if you're a, if you're a cynic, you can, you can go there and you can see the real science and the real link. But he simplifies it for anybody um, who, who just wants to know the basics. And he's simplified it down to three fundamental terms that which drive health uh, and life on Earth. And he, he, he calls it the three legged stool, light, water and magnetism. Um, and light, that's pretty much in order of, of, um, of importance. Light is the fundamental driver of all things on Earth. It's the only energy source that we as a planet actually have everything that we get comes from the sun um, and our bodies were designed whether you believe in creationism or whatever the hell you believe in but if you look back millions and millions of years ago when there was nothing here um, the only thing that we had as, a, as an input was light from the sun and so our org the organisms that eventually became us were driven by this light and the, the curious thing about light on earth is that it, it moves in a cycle so you have the sun comes up in the morning and you have light the sun goes down at, down at night and you have the absence of light so from a if you're a sort of computer 
programmer or a systems engineer, you can see that quite simply there, you've got an on off switch. In very basic terms, the sun comes up, that's a kick, that's the on switch. Sun goes down, that's the off switch. So you've, you've got two things to work with there. Um, and then when the light source is available during the day, you've got various frequencies and various forms of light. You've got the simple visible red, blue, green, which is available first thing in the morning. You've got the infrared, which is the heat, uh, long wavelength heat element of things, which is available whenever the sun is uh, in the sky. And then as the sun progresses through the sky, I mean, the sun emits the same radiation constantly, but because of our atmosphere, um, when the sun's low in the sky, it has to travel through a lot of atmosphere to get to you on Earth. So the shorter wavelength um, ultraviolet stuff gets blocked by the, by the clouds and the atmosphere. And then when the sun's directly overhead, it has a much shorter path, so more of the ultraviolet comes through. So during the day, sun starts off with red, infrared, blue and green at sunrise. And then as it progresses through the sky, and gets overhead, you get ultraviolet A begins mid morning, let's say in the summertime. Yeah. Um, and then once you get to the absolute middle of the day, you get ultraviolet B, which is the most powerful. And so again, looking at your body as a as a receptor, imagine over millions of years your, your cells have organized themselves. And so some cells are specialized in picking up the ultraviolet. So when the ultraviolet appears, that triggers another another switch in your system on a, a, a bunch of different circuits. And then the ultraviolet B triggers another set of circuits. And then the ultraviolet B disappears. That's another off switch. The ultraviolet A disappears. That's another mm. off switch. Then you go through to the, the gradual dimming of, of the light towards the sunset. That's another process. And then you get the, the absence of light, the total absence of light at night time. So historically, that's how, or ancestrally, that's how we evolved. Uh, we were totally naked, barefoot, wandering around on the earth, exposed to all that sunlight during the day. And then at night time, we disappeared into a cave and we were exposed to nothing except the, uh, mag the fundamental magnetism from the earth's core, which is also driven by the solar, um, solar power in, in the first place. Yeah. Um, and so the concept of health is, uh, and then how, 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 so I've mentioned light and magnetism, water is the, the um, intermediary, it's the electromagnetic capture system that we have. Um, and there's some work that uh, has been done by a, by a um, scientist called Gerald, Dr. Gerald Pollock, who has published a great book called The Fourth Phase of Water, that where he highlights just how complex water actually is and how it's misunderstood by science. And water has a fourth phase, which is kind of like a plasma phase. Um, and so if you shine light on water, <clears throat> if you shine infrared light on water, the water molecules will respond and they organize in a certain way. So the energy from the infrared light becomes capped in the water and the water structures itself and changes its its size and shape and we are made up of 70 percent water 99 percent water by molecules 70 percent by weight but, yeah. but in terms of number of molecules in our body that 99 percent of your of your body's molecules are water yeah so water is the the device that we use to capture the vibration from the sun. Um, and then once you, if you, if you take water in a, in a confined space, in a cellular space, and you shine in for red light on it, it changes, it, it captures some of that energy and it, it structures. And then the new structure it reaches means that it's more receptive to ultraviolet light. But if you then shine ultraviolet light on water that's already been shone on by, ultra, by infrared light, the water absorbs even more energy and structures into an even more compact manner, capturing the energy and the information from the sunlight. So that's how our cells 
use light water and, and the magnetism is really um uh the magnetism's a fundamental sort of stable force which we get almost like a reference point that we get from from the earth which is a, a fixed mm. um a, a fixed force i consider it as almost like a fulcrum like a lever i mean it's it's hard to conceptualize this but yeah uh, but those uh, are the three fundamentals there's a guy uh walter russell i think he did a lot of work on electron magnetism about 100 mm. years ago absolute genius yeah yeah i mean magnetism's a very very misunderstood force it, we don't learn much about it in school apart from little magnets and things yeah, yeah, yeah. um but it's actually very very complex uh magnetism and still to this day i, I consider it as my weak point that i don't I don't fully understand magnetism as much as i do light um so basically jack's um jack's guidance to people are is get outside in the early morning and expose your naked eyes, naked skin, specifically the eyes. The eyes are vital to to expose to sunlight. And you can stare at the sun. When the sun rises, it just comes over the horizon. You can stare at it with your naked eyes and there's no damage. Yeah. Um, you don't want to stare at it in the middle of the day. So if you receive that, that on signal in the morning and when the sun goes down, if you then preserve darkness in your house, you're living like an ancestral human being would. So you're, you're respecting the on, on switch and the off switch. If you then get exposure during the day uh, on a regular basis, you're again, um, you're replicating as much as possible how, how humans were designed. Um, so you're respecting the, the, the original design of the human body. Mm. Um, and you need to have obviously sufficient, um, sufficient water intake uh, you don't want to be dehydrated and you need food needs to be local from you know, for, according to where you live. So that was going to be a question. Does the latitude of where we live affect these circadian rhythms? Uh, yes, absolutely. Because <clears throat> obviously, if you're on the equator, you've got the sun rises at the same time every day, every day. The sun rises and sets at the same time every day. You've got 12 hours darkness, 12 hours sunlight. Um, and so that's a, that's a sort of a simple rhythm to get into. Um, if, like like us at the moment, we're in the sort of fifty something degrees north latitude, there's a considerable difference between the summer and the winter. So you've got this variation. So the the, the on switch every day now, the on switch is slightly earlier, and the off switch is slightly later. So you've got a variation, which our bodies, as we uh, migrated north away from the equator it seems that most people the, the original human beings um they went back to somewhere in africa which is probably the the equatorial region mm. so as we moved out from that area our bodies began to experience different levels of light stress and so mm. we've we've become um adapted able to adapt to to a differing light input um, which is slightly more stressful on our bodies but whenever you stress something as long as you don't break it you're you're putting information into it and then it can rebound it's like a you know, it's like a rebounder you, you're putting in extra stress and then as long as you don't smash the machinery that yeah. extra stress can rebound and, and provide you with ongoing energy and information um, this all links back to mitochondria because it's it's your mitochondria that are the sensors for your environment. Um, your, your your genetic machinery from your mother and your father is is the physical structure. Then every single cell has hundreds or thousands of mitochondria, which are bacterial in origin, uh, and they come from your mother. Uh, you inherit the the mitochondria from your mother, and the mitochondria are the they produce the energy, but they also distribute and organize the energy so from a from a computing analogy that your father and mother create the dna which creates the hardware and then the mitochondria is the energy management software uh, which runs on the hardware um, and the mitochondria are they produce energy and they distribute energy they, they organize energy flows in the body but what they also do is they sense the environment so that they're, they're incredibly sensitive environmental sensors um 
and so and they respond very very strongly to light and the way that the light affects the water that surrounds the mitochondria so if you're living in an environment like we are now in in in, um, in northern europe food that's available around you is also produced by the sun all, all food comes from the sun ultimately um, and so when you eat food it's not so much about the macronutrients or the calories or the, or the, the fats or whatever the hell it is in the food um, food is um, it, it, it's a sort of blueprint or a, or a fingerprint whatever you want to call it of sunlight it's it represents sunlight that was captured yeah um and so if, I, if you take it back to photosynthesis photosynthesis takes energy from the sun water from the ground and carbon dioxide from the air and it creates a carbohydrate okay so that the sun the sun's energy moves yeah breaks apart the carbon breaks apart the water and produces a carbohydrate so that energy is required from the sun to change those chemical bonds and you've now got a carbohydrate a more complex molecule um, and within that molecule because it took energy to make that molecule the energy from the sun was absorbed you have captured sunlight in the carbohydrate so then when the carbohydrate is consumed by by you and it's broken down and used as energy you you break down the molecule and you release you actually you do the reverse of a plant a plant leaf takes carbon dioxide water and energy from the sun and our mitochondria reverse that process so we take a carbohydrate we break it apart we produce energy we produce water we produce co2 and the energy when it's released is used and cap it's captured in the water it's captured in our in our systems yeah. for, for use later but the key thing here is that the light that that was originally captured in the carbohydrate is released when the carbohydrate breaks down so if if the carbohydrate was you was using high energy electrons during the summer when carbohydrates are produced in the field the light energy that's captured in a carbohydrate is high powered summer sunshine which contains lots of blue and lots of ultraviolet so when the electron which is the, the part of the molecule which is the, the, the mental particle that's captured um, when that electron falls back down to its ground state it's 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 held in the carbohydrate above its ground state when the when the carbohydrate breaks down the electron yeah. falls back down to to its ground state and it releases a photon of light same photon that was used yeah, to yeah. create it in the summer and so that light has to be congruent or coherent with the light that your body is receiving okay so if you're in england in december <clears throat> There's no ultraviolet light. There are very short days, and there are no carbohydrates growing in the field. So, if you eat a banana, which is grown in tropical sunlight, you can buy a banana in Tesco all year round. Mm. But if you buy a banana in December and you eat that banana in the UK in December, when it breaks down in your body, the photons that get released are high powered caribbean photons mm. from equatorial sunlight and your body is receiving all this information that the days are short there's no ultraviolet light so your skin's not getting any ultraviolet light so the structuring of your water and the structuring of all your molecules is suggesting to your body that it's winter and that you should not be expected to receive high powered molecules high-powered high um, electrons or high-powered photons Photon, yeah. and so <clears throat> if you do eat the banana and these high-powered um, photons suddenly get released your body is not structured to deal with them and so they can cause damage and they cause confusion because 
your body's like, well, hang on, I thought we're in the winter and now suddenly we've got a tropical fruit. What the hell's going on? So you cause a, a disturbance in your overall um, body's, what, uh, your overall body's vibration or field is, is structured for a, for a winter program and you, yeah, you yeah. throw in this disturbance. And, and that, what would be the that, effect of that on the body? Well, the, the body is always striving to gather as much information as possible, trying to measure when the sun rises, how strong it is, what the frequencies are, uh, what the temperature is, all sorts of inputs that we're not even aware of. This is automatic, it's an autopilot type yeah. system. Yeah. And so the more information and the more accurate the information is um, about you and your environment, the better the body can make these fine adjustments so you 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 will run in a in a coherent smooth healthy manner everything will like a finely tuned orchestra with a, with a tremendous conduct everything will just run fantastically well if you throw in something that's out of tune or out of sync like a banana in winter um it's going to sound like a uh, like a bum note in an orchestra Mm -hmm. or, or a dodgy beat in a band it, it's going to just knock you off and so it's 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 hard to explain what effect it will have um and the effect will be different in different people but it's going to be um it's going to be slightly out of tune uh, and so jack's view on on food is that wherever you live on earth you should be consuming the food that grows naturally around there at that time of year. So in England, um, in the winter, nothing really grows. Uh, so you shouldn't really be eating any carbohydrates. Um, you certainly shouldn't be eating any fruits. Um, and you should be living on fat, animal fat, fish, those kind of things. Um, and then as you go through the seasons, uh, you get into the summer, late summer, and carbohydrates begin to appear. And towards the end of summer, um, we get fruit, natural occurring berries, that sort of thing. So I eat berries and stuff in the summer. Um, not many, but I, I have some. I have some honey, that type of thing. Um, and your body's prepared for it because your body's receiving the ultraviolet. So your body's getting the ultraviolet vibrations on the skin and in the water um, and that prepares the structure of your mitochondria to receive the high powered energy so the high powered ultraviolet photons bang they get released but your body's already primed for it so it can handle them smoothly without creating any damage to the system whereas in winter it's almost like you're in winter it's almost like you're you're structured for a for a low voltage system and you can run on low voltage quite efficiently. Um, and if you were to fire in some high voltage, you might short out some of the circuits. That's kind of an analogy. So you can, you can damage yourself um, by, by putting in the wrong fuel at the wrong time of year. Now, there's no right or wrong thing to eat. Um, but as you said, it, it's very latitude dependent. Yeah. Um, and, and, and how, depends, how, how far back year. would that go, Graham? So so let's say I was born in Africa. Uh, sorry, I, I've got Af uh, African lineage, let's say f five, 600 years. Um, I, I was born in the UK. What difference would that have if I were born here compared to if, you know, I was well, born in Africa and moved here? It, here's the thing. It, um, it depends on your mitochondrial heritage from your mother. And okay. so if, Let's say you were born an English father and uh, an African mother who um, who was still living in Africa, but you, you happen you, she moved to England. You were born in England. You would have African mitochondria from your mother, uh, and you would be forced to adapt to your new environment in in the UK, and so. Your mitochondria can adapt relatively quickly. It's not it's not instant, but um, after a few months or years, you would have figured they, they would have figured out a way of working within your structure. And the, the mitochondria themselves 
um, they mutate and they they evolve much more, much more quickly. Our, our our nuclear DNA barely changes. You can go for hundreds of generations with barely a change in your DNA. The, the idea of genetic mutation is very, very overstated. But your mitochondrial DNA, because they're bacterial in origin, they mutate much more rapidly and, and they're much more adaptable. You know, why, we've, why um, Mother Nature chose a mitochondria as the sensor, because it's much more able to, to react mm. and adapt. And so, if you've got mitochondrial DNA in the UK, you might find that uh, in the winter you felt cold. Um, African mitochondria or equatorial mitochondria, it's warm there. You don't really, on the equator, you don't really need to generate your body heat. You, you rarely have temperatures that, that are cold enough to, to, to need you to generate body heat. Um, uh, that's called a sort of tightly coupled mitochondria. The, the energy that the, the mitochondria produces is all goes towards energy, direct energy, like physical energy. Yeah. Um, if you've got North European or, or high latitude DNA, your mitochondria are more loosely coupled. And so there are points on the mitochondrial energy flow where you can siphon off heat, it's like a sort of escape valve, and you can release energy in the form of heat and so people from northern climes have a much better ability to produce their own body heat and to keep them warm because they've had through millions of years of, of evolution they've, they've developed that and so it would, it would be quite understandable if someone who had maternal equatorial uh, dna um, mitochondrial dna that they would have a tough time adapting to to cold climates yeah, they could eventually do it, um, but you, and you'd also have the situation where the, the you would require more sunlight because you you're, you'd be designed to receive far more sunlight. So dark-skinned people in Northern Europe have a tough time. And if you look at the medical history of of, um, of dark-skinned people in in uh, North America or in Europe. They suffer from many different diseases, and their their health is relatively poor compared to the rest of the population. And fundamentally, that's down to the fact that they're not getting anywhere near enough um, enough sunlight, because mm. they really do need the extra sunlight because they're designed to do that. They have dark skin, which means to to achieve the same effect, they have to be in the sun much longer. Right. So you or I could step into the sunlight in the midsummer and within if we took our shirts off within 15 20 minutes we've generated sufficient vitamin d yeah whereas you take a dark skinned person in the uk in summer they might need two or three hours exposure so if you put that into the real world we all wear clothes yeah people foolishly wear sunglasses um we live an indoor existence uh, we, you know, we, we get up indoors, we get into our car, we drive to work, we go into the office, we, we're indoors. And so the amount of sunlight and the amount of, if you think of the percentage of your skin that's exposed, it's your face and your hand. Um, and so for you and I, that's a negative. But for a dark skinned person, it's really negative. Yeah, yeah. Because they need, they need three or four times the amount of exposure that we do. And so it, it's something that, you know, needs to be borne in mind we need to it, it's difficult to say exactly how much sunlight we need yeah um but it's clear that we need the, the most fundamental thing is is the on off switch the the circadian rhythms have been have been proven to be an absolute fundamental driver of, of health in mm. at all levels mm. and so everybody needs to respect the sunrise and the sunset which means getting up early and getting outside and getting the exposure and everyone needs to respect the darkness that's another fundamental key where we're supposed to be exposed to energy inputs during daylight and then when the sun goes down we're supposed to be in rest and repair mode yeah which is when we would crawl into our cave and and and, and sleep and repair so the modern world has 
got that wrong at both ends because we now we don't get the sun exposure we cover our skin with clothes maybe with sun cream sunglasses so we're cutting off the inputs that we're supposed to be receiving and then when the sun goes down that's the message to which programs to the nighttime relax repair recover uh, program and in the modern world we switch on electric lights we just stare in front stare at screens tvs phones until very late into the evening so we then end up delaying our sleep cycle reducing the amount of melatonin that's available which is absolutely key melatonin has many many uh, uses in the body it's known as the sleep hormone but it's also the hormone that's responsible for repairing damage to mitochondria so if you if you get l- insufficient melatonin and it gets released melatonin only gets released after three or four hours of darkness technically speaking three or four hours of absence of blue light um and so if you're doing like the average person you're staring at a screen until midnight or watching netflix in bed before you go to sleep you're telling your body that it's midday yeah so it's switching off the melatonin the moment you switch off the netflix you need three or four hours for the melatonin to increase be released and then it needs a few hours to do its job so if you're going to bed at midnight, switch off your Netflix, you need three hours to release sufficient melatonin. That takes you to 3 a.m. And then you need a few hours for the cycle. It's like a washing machine. There's a, there's a cycle that takes place. And the, the repair cycle is supposed to happen every night. And it needs seven to nine hours of decent sleep to complete yeah. those, that cycle. Let's say seven hours minimum. So if you're going to bed at midnight and you haven't got sufficient melatonin until 2 or 3 a.m. and you need seven hours, you're going to need to sleep until 10. If you sleep till 10, you've missed the sunrise and you're probably late for work. Mm. So most people are going to bed at midnight, sleeping to some degree, and then waking up at 7. Let's say the average person gets up around 7. So they've probably had half the amount of sleep and repair that's required. So some of their mitochondria will have been left unrepaired. So instead of facing the next day with a totally refurbished system, which is the design, um, we face the day with a slightly damaged system. So then we're less able to use the fresh energy for the next day. We probably create more damage during the next day. And then if we repeat the process every day, you can easily see that you're getting insufficient repair, which leads to suboptimal machinery for the next day, which leads to more damage, yeah. building up an even longer list of cells that need to be repaired, and you've still got insufficient repair. So the majority of health issues today, and I say the majority, I mean the vast majority, 80 90% of people's health issues are chronic diseases that have their root in the mitochondria in mitochondrial damage and that mitochondria have not that mitochondrial damage has not been repaired mainly due to lack of proper sleep so we really need to focus on get yourself up early get out in the light do your shit whatever you've got to do during the day it doesn't matter we've all got to live then make sure you block the blue light after the sun goes down Blue light is the is the trigger that our body uses in our eye and our skin to detect whether it's day or night. Right. If you if you use red light, you can kind of get away with it. So if you use candles and red lights and uh, orange glasses to block yeah. the blue light, you can get away with watching Netflix till ten or eleven at night or t- till midnight. Right? You can get away with it, and you'll you'll still release your melatonin, and you'll still get decent sleep, decent repair. And you can get up early in the morning and get on with your business. So those two simple things, get up early, try and see the sunrise and block the artificial blue light after dark. Mm. That's the most fundamental thing that anybody should aim for. Yeah. And it makes it, nowadays, it, it yeah. doesn't set, like you don't need a degree to, to realize this, do you? It's not a difficult oh. concept. It's, it's not at all. It, it, it's, I, I just say to people, try to live your life 
think, okay, we've all got jobs to do, we all have to earn a living and all that sort of stuff. But within that, try to replicate as much as possible how you would have lived 2,000 years ago. Wherever you are on the earth today, consider what that life would have been like 2,000 years ago and try to replicate that. So get yourself out in the morning, do some stuff. As soon as the sun, as soon as the sun comes up, you should be up and active. And as soon as the sun goes down, you should be less active and you shouldn't have any artificial light or at least no artificial blue should be hitting your eyes or skin. So you, you, can, you can get a screen for, you can get red lights and candles. Uh, if you want to watch a screen, which most people will do, uh, you can get a cover for your screen or you can get um you can get some software which reduces the blue um or you can get the the blue blocking light blue blocking glasses um and you want to cover your skin so you want to wear wear something that you know wear a high high collared shirt uh, if you're a woman you wear some sort of scarf if you're in front of a screen mm. and wear long sleeves um so you can get away with modern day yeah you don't have to live like a caveman you, know, you can still watch your netflix uh but you have to take some steps and and it it may seem like you know it's it's sort of it's overkill but it really isn't because it, it it's so fundamental this this day night cycle of stress followed by repair is how we were designed to work we, we're designed to get damaged during the day we're designed to receive stresses to get chased by animals, to get injured, to get yeah, to get exhausted, to, to pull muscles, all these things um, were designed to do that. But we have to respect that we need sleep and we don't just need the seven hours in bed, we need the three hours of darkness before that. And that's, if you respect that, you will go a long way to repairing any damage that you've done. The great thing about your, your mitochondria is they can repair themselves we have this all these abilities in our body to, to repair our systems that have been damaged mm. and so most people you, if you speak to most people nowadays they don't sleep well even relatively young people i mean i have friends who are in their 20s and they have poor sleep they struggle to get to sleep they wake up in the middle of the night they wake up in the morning they still feel exhausted um and so if you fix that you go an awful long way to, to ensuring that you will have decent health and if you are in a terrible state have you know a list of chronic illnesses a very very basic way to start is, is get up and force yourself to get up and see the sunrise get out as much as possible during if it, even if it means you work in an office go out for a cigarette break you don't have to smoke yeah, yeah. Just go out and stand in front of the building in the daylight three or four times during the day um, and expose as much skin as you possibly can don't wear sunglasses don't wear contact lenses if you wear if you have to wear spectacles to see you can take them off you can put them down your nose or on your head just get that exposure during the day uh, because the, the sunlight exposure during the day actually generates melatonin so the more sunlight you get the more melatonin you create and then when you when the sun goes down, respect the rule of no blue light and the melatonin you've created during the day will be released. It will have time to do its job. It will repair things. It doesn't happen overnight that you're if, if you're if you're young and you're a little bit unwell. It, it may only be two or three weeks and you will feel fit as a fiddle. If, if you respect this for two or three weeks, if you're chronically ill and you're in your 50s or 60s and you have been ill for many years then it's going to take six months to a year possibly longer um and you may even if, if you're living in the north of england and you're struggling you may even consider moving somewhere closer to the equator for six months you know if, if i had something like multiple sclerosis or something like that um i would certainly consider uh taking six months off work and going to live near the equator Mm. to rebuild myself and then come back um back to my uh yeah, original place in the north yeah. of england i mean the age... there's something that jack says yeah you know, jack on, says jack says something very clearly that um 
it's not possible to get well in the same environment in which you became unwell. So if you just carry on doing what you're doing in terms of light exposure, yeah. you're not going to fix yourself. It doesn't matter how much good food or exercise you do, you're not going to get better unless you change the environment that your body senses. Mm. It doesn't I mean you have to move. Does this go to the argument of the, the germ theory where it's like blaming the pathogen rather than actually having a clean terrain? And working alongside nature to create that balance um well the germ theory is that that's a slightly different because we're talking about i mean the majority of people in the world today are not ill because of germ mm. or, or infectious diseases the majority if you look at the the, the killer uh, and and the, the 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 majority of people who go regularly to the doctor and and, and receive prescriptions they are chronic diseases of modern society. So the germ, th the, the whole germ idea is a, is a slightly different. Um, so the, the um, just we, we had a small interruption there. Um, so the germ theory is, is that um, is what's used by medicine and currently and has been since the time of Pasteur. And it believes that germs are bad and your body needs to get rid of them always. And it's the germs that are at fault. And if you can sort of somehow um, kill the germs then the body will be fine whereas the terrain theory says that the germs are not necessarily dangerous they're there and they may serve uh, a positive purpose as long as they're in balance with the terrain if the terrain is uh, too open to the germs or too conducive to the growth of germs the germs will overgrow and they'll cause problems so the terrain theory believes that you should maintain your body and its structure and its rhythms and its vibrations or whatever you want to call it the the the, the whole any way you choose to describe what what terrain is so if you're in a fit state and your body's operating in a coherent manner a germ should be no big deal it, it will have nowhere to go nothing to do um and so it won't cause any problem if you're not operating at 100 percent let's say you're eating bananas in the middle of winter and you've caused some problem and you're not seeing the sunrise and you're seeing too much and you're watching too much netflix at, at, at midnight all these things will knock your body out of out of its correct vibration yeah um and that creates terrain which maybe the germ will take advantage of so the germs are also there to keep us in balance the germs um germs are there to bacteria, virus, whatever you want to call them, they emerge when we stray from the sort of perfect, coherent bodily function or terrain function. Mm. And then the germs somehow get us back into line again. So there are two, two camps. There's the, the camp that says the germs are bad and there's the camp that says it's all about the terrain. Yeah. And then I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, if your terrain is, you can never expect to be perfect. No one can expect to have an absolutely perfectly functioning body. And so every now and again, when you get slightly off balance, you might get an infection and you might then go, oh, I'm ill. But that's just a message. That's just yeah. that the germs are doing their job. They're there to counterbalance the moments when you get out of balance. And so they create this message and, you know, you get a stomach upset, headache or whatever it happens to be. Um, and that's really just the germs have triggered your body into responding. And that will, if you allow the, um, the disease to run its course and you recognize the message that it's sending, which is something's not quite, you know, I'm something a little bit out of line here and you pay a little bit more attention to some of the things that you might be doing wrong that are causing disease in the first place um and then the whole thing should be self-correcting but obviously eventually as as you age your ability to self-correct and your ability to repair gradually declines and so you're then able to withstand less 
insults and less from them. Mm. Um, and so eventually we all die. So eventually there comes a point where, uh, you know, an old person succumbs to pneumonia and dies, which happens in a, in a lot of cases. Um, does that mean that a virus or a bacteria killed that person? Well, depends how you measure it. But what it really means is that your body's unable to return to coherence. No matter how many things you try, your body's simply not that old, worn out and out of line that mm. it's the end of the story. And then the germs are there to break you down and, and it's yeah. the end of your life. You know, it, it, the so, world, so as, you men as you mentioned earlier about you worked in the financial system and um, you didn't know you were working in 20, 30 years. You didn't know the reality behind the financial system. I'm supposing the medical system in the same way, they could be working in 30, 40 years and oh, not yeah. understand a lot of what's actually the reality behind the human body, because it's actually not given to them at university and school. That's right. It's not, I mean, put some people, um, they, they, some people can be very critical of doctors and certain doctors, deserve criticism in my opinion but the majority of doctors are doing their best with the tools that they've been given and the information and and education that they've been given um doctors are taught an increasingly narrow syllabus of information doctors i mean as we know it's a disgrace but uh in in your if you do doctor training you do five maybe seven years in total and out of that time i think they do two weeks at most of nutrition so they cover the very basics in nutrition and the way nutrition is taught to them it's basically the same as the average joe learns in terms of the food pyramid you yeah, know you've yeah. got stuff your face with bread and carbohydrate <laughs> and yeah it, it's it's appalling but that's the way it's gone um doctors learn nothing about light all they know is that ultraviolet causes damage but it also makes vitamin d that is literally all they learn about light and then they learn that if they shine a light on the pupil it, it dilates yeah yeah mm. that that is the extent of their knowledge on light um they uh, regarding water bear in mind these these are jack cruz's three fundamental principles he, he believes he's distilled all explanation of life down to these three principles light one the so doctors learn like one percent of the story on light not even that then water doctors learn that water is necessary so we need hydration so they can measure when you're dehydrated and things like that and they can measure your urine and all that sort of stuff but otherwise they consider that water is neutral and negligible when they're examining in cells they dehydrate cells they take away all the water and they look at what's left over they look at all the bits and they go oh, well in this cell we found this that and calcium and phosphorus and that and the other because they've taken the water out and they then try to figure out what might be happening Whereas if you kept the water there and you examined it and you considered how the water interacts with all those different molecules, you'd get a completely different story. So they basically ignore water, whereas it's actually a fundamental intermediary in all reactions throughout the body yeah. constantly. And then magnetism, they don't learn anything about at all. So three fundamental principles. You may not believe Jack Bruce, but I'm telling you, the guy, the guy is a genius and he has distilled it down. He, could, he can argue the point that those three fundamentals, if you understand those, you understand life and health and wellness and illness. Um, so if our doctors are not learning anything about those three fundamental things, you have to question whether their training is really appropriate for what they're being asked to do. And so it's quite unfair that they've been thrown into this role of, of trying to heal people um, and they're just not prepared for it.
what they are prepared for is, uh, <clears throat> and we know the story because it was so that the, the modern medical industry was created by the Rockefellers and the Carnegies in the 20s, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and they took over all the, all the medical schools. They began to write all the medical books. And everything is geared towards providing a pill for an ill. So, and nowadays you notice that very, very obviously, if you go, if you ever go to the doctor, um, <clears throat> it's now the doctor talks to you for his 10 minutes and he's tapping away on his keyboard. He's asking you questions and he's hitting buttons because the whole diagnostic process now has been stripped down to, do you have symptom A? Yes. Do you have symptom B? No. Click, 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 click. And then you press go. And at the bottom, it comes out with, prescribe this medication so the whole system of, of of our interaction with doctors nowadays is stripped back to minimal level of understanding of the, of the symptoms minimal level even less understanding of the what's what's going on behind this what has caused the symptoms but the machine just tells him this drug will suppress those symptoms so the entire system is set up to um prescribe medicines it, mm. it's a the doctors are, are running a sales and distribution job for the pharmaceutical industry that's the sad state of it wow and even if they wanted to i mean we have to assume that most doctors go into it uh, because they're fundamentally good people and they want to heal people uh but they're they're really not they're barely allowed to help what they have to do if if they don't subscribe if the machine says you should subscribe xyz pharmaceutical if they don't subscribe that and then the patient goes away and gets worse or or, or worst case dies there could be a comeback on the doctor because then the the, the, the his supervisor is going to go the machine told you to, to to prescribe xyz and you didn't and the guy died so there's a lot of pressure on doctors to do exactly as the machinery says mm. so i feel sorry for doctors then I, I don't have any envy at all of the position that they're in no. um and their system is also it's it's fine for treating the medical system is great if you get run over you get run over by a bus they're very good at scraping you off the road taking you to the hospital keeping you alive fixing you with this sort of trauma care um, and some of the excellent diagnostics that they've got, some of that's fantastic. But where it really slips up is in the management and treatment of chronic disease, the understanding of chronic disease. Doctors don't really learn about mitochondria. If you ask a doctor, even a recently qualified doctor, what is a mitochondria? He will simply over this L, which is what you learn at school in mm. O level, A level biology. Yeah. They don't have an understanding of mitochondrial dysfunction, which leads to mitochondrial driven chronic diseases. And because that element is absent in their training, they completely misdiagnose all chronic diseases and they mistreat chronic diseases, which is why they don't have any success, which is why the biggest killers are heart disease, cancer, a neurodegeneration mm. mitochondria in your body we have them everywhere but the biggest concentration is in our brain and in our heart and then so if you have mitochondrial dysfunction you're going to get neurodegenerative problems first you're going to get heart disease first and if you get body-wide systemic mitochondrial dysfunction that leads to cancer because it's a it's a it's, it's an energy problem across yeah. the body yeah and so those are the three biggest killers and they're all mitochondrial diseases so before graham before we wrap this up give three things that the listeners can do to improve their overall holistic well-being um well it's interesting you said three light water and magnetism uh, so that means <laughs> it's it's back to that it really is um you should see every sunrise if possible 
you should respect the sunset, meaning begin to do less things and block the blue light after sunset. So you've got to respect those two things. Um, and then live your life in terms of sun exposure and food exposure, what food you eat, should depend entirely on where you are living and what would have been available a couple of thousand years ago where you're living. So eat the type of food that would have been available in your local environment a few hundred years ago. Okay. So you shouldn't be living on imported foods. No. Yeah, you should be living on stuff which could and does grow around you. And that's fairly, that isn't difficult to do. It just takes a bit of responsibility. Yeah. And if you do that, if you do those three things, see the sunrise, respect the sunset and the following darkness, and you eat according to the food that would have been available in your area hundreds of years ago, if you do those few things for just a couple of, couple of months, you will notice an improvement. You'll begin to realise that you're on the right track. That's great. So, Graham, where can people find you and the Human Unleashed? Um, well, as I was saying to, to Alex earlier, we, myself and three colleagues have come together to try to share information regarding health uh, from an overwhelming sort of holistic, but it's not just holistic in the traditional sense of the word. It, it's, we're looking at different inputs and, 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 and so we, we've, there's, there's four of us, the humanunleashed.com. Uh, if you go there at the moment, we've got um, uh, there's lots of we're doing some stuff on the the uh, COVID virus, and we've got some free uh, free videos, and we've got a free offer, a free sign up. Uh, otherwise, we're trying to come to a, a sort of pricing structure where it's a subscription service where people have access to our content, and they all have, also have access to the four of us on a fortnightly basis uh, with Q and A's and stuff like that. So uh, the humanunleashed.com would be the page to go to. Uh, sign up for free at the moment. Have a delve into our content. See what you think. And if you consider signing up for the longer term, we'd love to see you in there. I'm highly recommended. Graham, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, speak to you soon. Thank you very much, Alex. Cheers, Graham. Cheers, see you.